Hi guys, welcome back to AP Statistics. So today we're going to start looking at uh, hypothesis tests and confidence intervals with two samples, two, distrib or two, two proportions in particular for this one. So we're going to first take a look at what the sampling distribution is like when we have two proportions. And then we're going to look at how to make confidence intervals. All right, so it is going to be very similar to, to what we were using before. It's just now we have double everything. So we need two random samples. And these random samples both need to be independent random samples. So like one sample will probably be of size whatever and one from population one. And then the other sample will be or another random sample of size N2 from population two. They might be from the same population, but they still need to be independent in some way. So one of them will give us a P, P1, one of the other one will give us a P2. Right? If it, we're actually taking it from a sample, then it'll be P hat one and P hat two. Right, so if we want the mean for the sampling distribution, that's usually the easy part. The notation's a little long, so it's the mean sub P1 hat minus P2 hat. That's the sampling distribution of the difference in all the different proportions we'd get by from taking two samples of the same sizes N1 and N2. N1 and N2 can be different sizes, but they keep having to be at size N1, and they must keep being size N2. We get that the mean difference is just a population proportion, so the P, not P hat, P from the first one minus the population proportion from the second one. So it works just like the other one, which is P before, now we're subtracting, so now it's just the difference. All right, to tell if it's normal or not, we just have to do if each one of them is normal. So like if the, the N1 and P1 ends up being normal, like the greater than 10, and the N times one minus P1 is greater than or equal to 10, and then the same thing happens for population two and proportion two and sample size two, if both of them end up being normal, then we can say that the d difference, the sampling distribution of the difference of all the samples we could take would also be normal. All right, the standard deviation, usually we just have this first part here. Like that is usually our standard deviation for just like P1. All right, but we have two of them, so now we just add them together. All right, so we just add them together. It's both under the square root. It's just part of our combining distribution rules, like our Pythagorean theorem. This is how it would work out. All right, so that is how we do that. All right. Similarly, for standard error, so if we're doing standard error instead of standard deviation, like if we didn't know the population P's, we would use all the, the P hats here instead. But I think we'll get to that later. All right, so one example here, you want to compare two brands of colored goldfish crackers, the original brand goldfish and another store brand. We believe goldfish has 25% red crackers, and the store brand has 20% red crackers. So that's the store brand. Each bag consists of more than 1,000 crackers. Using a cup, your teacher takes a random sample of 50 crackers from Goldfish and a separate random sample of 60 crackers from the store brand. Let P hat 1 minus P hat 2 be the difference in the sample proportion of red crackers. All right, so what's the mean of the sampling distribution? So the mean of P1 hat, the Goldfish proportion, minus P2 hat, the store brand proportion would be the 0.25 minus the 0.20, so it'd be 0 0.05. All right, the standard deviation of, again, the difference for the sampling distribution would be the square root of P1. So this is my P1, what I believe it to be is, is 0 0.25. Then one minus 0 0.25 over the sample size, and the sample size for the goldfish was... So this would be our N150. Plus, and then we do the same thing for the store brand. So we've got 20% red, 1 minus the 20%, and we have 60 of them. All right, so that would be how we get our standard deviation for the sampling distribution. We just throw that in our calculator from there. Oftentimes on the AP exam, they'll just leave it in the formula form. Go, so it is. it might be better to, to know the formula form than to be able to just throw it in your calculator. And the shape, so this is where we actually have to do some work. So we've got N1 times P1, so that means 50 times 0.25 equals 25% of 50 is what, 12.5? That's greater than or equal to 10. That checks out. 50 times 1 minus 0.25 will be... 50 minus 12.5 is 37.5, which is also greater than or equal to 10. That checks out. Now we're going to do the same thing with the, the store brand. So we got 60 times 0.20 is, is that 12? Greater than or equal to 10. That checks out. 
60 times 1 minus 0.20. So 80% of 60 is 48, which is also greater than or equal to 10. So it checks out we do have an approximately normal sampling distribution. See, red goldfish, there's one. All right, so confidence intervals, how we find confidence intervals. It's very similar. We're following our state plan to conclude. All right, so now the, we're going to have to do double the work here when we start offsetting. We have to state what P1 and P2 stand for. And remember, both of them need to have the phrase true proportion of, and then whatever they're talking about, list all the known statistics. So like you'll have P1 hat, you'll have P2 hat, you have N1, you'll have N2, that sort of stuff. And the confidence level, C equals like 95% or whatever. Remember, we're back to confidence intervals now, not hypothesis tests anymore. All right, we got to state what we're doing. So now we are using two samples. So we want to state two samples. With P's, we're using Z's. Zap tax, it's still a thing. P's, give us Z's. We're making an interval, and it's for the difference of the two. All right, so we want to see what's an what's a approximation for the difference between the two just from a sample. We need to have two independent random samples. So again, don't just write the word random. Independent random samples. Check. All right. Usually they're coming from two different populations, so the independence is not difficult to say. But just say it. All right. For the normal, we have the all four of the n p and the n times one minus p conditions to check out, and this is all going to be with p hat. So we will have p hats for p one and p two. All right, and independence, each one, N1 and N2, will have to be less than 10% of the population. So this would be population 1, and this would be population 2. All right, we can do this on our calculator, which is what I suggest. It is the one, 2 prop, because now we have two proportions, 2 proportion Z interval. All right, if we are writing it out by hand, that's how we write it out by hand. It's the same thing as before. It's, it's the, the difference of the samples the sample stuff, plus or minus the Z score, or the critical value, times the standard error. So here's our standard error. Notice we have the hats in here. The calculator will take care of all that, though it's sometimes it is written out like this on the AP exam, and this is on your AP formula sheet as well. And then we do our conclusion. We are blank percent confident that the interval from blank to blank, we don't need units here because we're working with proportions, they're percents, captures, right, don't forget your verb, captures the true difference in proportion, P1 minus P2, and then state what it equals in words. All right, so it would be the difference of whatever we're talking about up here. All right, if the interval contains zero, then it is possible that the proportions are the same. So if P1 minus P2 could be zero, that means P1 could equal P2. Let's take a look at an example here. All right, so patients with lower back pain are often given non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is abbreviated NSAIDs, the, like naproxen, to help ease their pain. Researchers wonder if taking Valium along with the proxim would affect pain relief. To find out, they recruited 112 patients with severe lower back pain and randomly assigned them to one of two treatments. One of them is naproxen and Valium or naproxen and placebo. So remember, placebo is like a fake drug that's not doing anything. After week one, 45 of the 57 who took naproxen and Valium reported reduced pain in the lower back compared to 37 out of 55 with the naproxen and the placebo. Construct and interpret a 99% confidence interval for the difference in the proportion of patients like these who would report reduced lower back pain after taking naproxen and Valium versus those after taking naproxen and placebo for a week. That was long, right? So let's, again, they're asking for a confidence interval, so let's make our box and just start filling in parts of our box. So first up, we've got one proportion, and let's see, we're talking about volume. So maybe I'll do P sub V for volume. Maybe that'll help me keep things straight. And this is the true proportion with pain relief taking naproxen and volume. There's an I in there, right? I, U, M. There we go. And P, let's see, placebo. Hmm. Let's just call this, I don't know. I don't want to call it PP. Maybe PL, the second letter in placebo, is the true proportion. P 
PP would just be confusing. Proportion. And we could do P1 and P2 if we wanted to. With pain relief, taking, I said taking, there we go, taking naproxen and placebo. All right, let's see. We want a 99% confidence interval. And we've got P1 hat or PV hat. We're, we're working with volume equals 45 out of 57. So that means this 57 is our N1. And PL placebo hat is 37 out of 55. And this 55 would be our N2. All right, so there's our state. Next, we plan. We're working with two samples. So this is a two sample. We're working with P's, proportions, right? 45 out of 57, 37 out of 55. Those are proportions. So we're going to do a Z interval for, and it's P1 and P2. So we just say P1 minus P2. All right, and let's see. We have two independent random samples check all right so we randomly assign them to groups right they were randomly assigned no one in one group it could be in the other group because they're in one group or the other so they are independent all right next our n times p all of our normal stuff so we'll look at pv the first one so we got 57 times 45 out of 57 gives us 45, which is greater than or equal to 10. That checks out. If we do 57 times 1 minus that, it'll just be 57 minus 45, which gives us 12, also greater than 10. Next, we do the same thing with the 55. 37 over 55 gives us 37, which is greater than or equal to 10. And then we've got 55 times 1 minus the 37 over 55, which is going to be the difference in those two which is, what is the difference in those two? 18, which is also greater than or equal to 10. So we do have an approximately normal sampling distribution. Sampling distribution, it's part of everything we do here. And independence. So N equal, N1 equals 57 and N2 equals 55, which are both truly less than 10% of all, let's see, what pain were they looking for? Lower back pain. All patients with lower back pain. Or all people, I guess we could say, with lower back pain. I'm telling you, sometimes sitting in this chair all day gives me lower back pain. So as long as we have over, let's see, 570 would be the biggest one. So as long as we have over 570 people on earth with lower back pain, we should be good there. All right, now we're going to do, so this is the two proportion, two prop, Z interval on our calculator. So let's pull our calculator back up here. There it is. On, and let's see, we're doing stat over to test. There it is. And two sample Z test, two sample Z test, two prop Z tests. Where is two prop? Where's one prop? There it is. Two prop Z interval. So it's all the way down to B. So it's a good ways down. All right. So our X1. So again, we're doing the, our V was one. So it would be 45 out of 57. And our X2 is 37. Out of 55, our confidence level we want was 99%. And we get, there's our interval. And it gives us the, a bunch of the values as well. But that's what we want, the interval there. So it's from negative 0 0.0975 to point three three one. That's a pretty large interval. But I guess we were going to get a large interval when we were doing... A 99% confidence interval will give us a bigger interval, remember? And we would write down everything else, but we've already got it written up here. So we've already got like all the, the, the P hats written up here. All right, so now we do our sentence. We are 99% confident 
that the interval from a negative snow problem, guys, we can have negatives, that's fine, negative 0.0975 to 0.331 captures the true difference in the proportion of people with back pain relief taking Valium versus placebo and naproxen. Right, these sentences can get kind of long, but you, you get the idea. The true proportion of differences, the true difference in proportions, either one of those phrases is fine of people taking that. And make sure we're, we're captures, present tense, or will captures, future tense, not past tense, captured. That doesn't work. All right, and based on the confidence interval in part A, what conclusions would you make about whether taking Valium along with naproxen affects pain relief? Justify your answers. All right, so sadly, zero is in the interval. which means the, the probability with pain relief with Valium could equal the probability of getting pain relief with the placebo. So there could be no difference. That is a plausible value. It doesn't matter that most of them in the interval are positive. It's just they could be zero. If we switch this to a 95% interval, it would probably get smaller, and then we would ha not have the zero in there, and we'd probably be happy. All right? But we went with the 99 to begin with, so we've got to stick with the consequences there. All right, so that is how we deal with sampling distributions and how we find confidence intervals where the difference of P's. Next one, we'll look at the hypothesis test.